all unique and different, and uh, I'm going to do something with the demo. And then following that is Brian Wilson. Uh, he's going to do Dox, Docus, Dox, Doxus, Doxus, uh, Doxus Coolness, uh, and then Bob Talks. So, uh, and then we'll keep on going. Press Mike, Billy Hoffman, uh, and then a contest giveaway awards and stuff tonight. So, uh, so welcome, PBR 90X. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Yep, happy birthday, old man. Someday we'll all be your age. Speaking at hacker cons. <laughs> well, um, I was really happy to, to be able to speak here today, and thanks for everybody coming out on a beautiful weekend and not uh, being outside at the park or whatever, being in here with our troglodytes. Um, so uh, today, what am I going to talk about? I think most of y'all are probably familiar with social networking sites, um, social networking applications, or these kind of things. They're actually coming up in the mainstream media. Uh, more and more frequently, um, you're going to hear you hear lots and lots of stories about failures, uh, information that's being disclosed on these applications. So we're going to talk uh, specifically about uh, Twitter and some about Facebook as well. Um, some scams out there, some uh, software vulnerabilities that have been exploited on Twitter and some of these other platforms. Um, some ways people have misused these platforms for command and control or uh, data exfiltration sort of purposes. Um, and uh, some areas that uh, would be ripe for some future research, including uh, exploiting these client applications that some of these platforms are using and exploiting APIs. Um, so social networking, right? I kind of already introduced it. Um, how many of y'all out there use one of these social networking systems or applications or sites? Facebook? Uh, or have a profile, for instance. LinkedIn, Facebook, MySpace, all those things. Hmm? Yeah, right, so a lot of people want to admit it, okay? Um, but when you think of the social networking in terms of, like, computer security, a lot of it is essentially a social disease. Uh, in terms of uh, th there's a high interaction model here. There's pokes, there's IMs, direct messages. Um, a lot of these platforms have ways that you can plug in uh, web application widgets into your profile that are essentially blobs of JavaScript and Flash. Um, so really, uh, one of the problems here, and, and people are utilizing this a lot for social uh, engineering, is this misplaced perception of trust and intimacy um, as you d go about your interactions in these systems. Um, and that's really one of, the, one of the main fails here, and it's a human failure in that sense. Um, as I mentioned, there's this lack of boundaries. There's a lack of you know, technical security boundaries in that essentially on these websites, your browser is uh, enforcing a same origin policy However, Facebook and Twitter, and the, or Facebook in particular, is sourcing uh, rich web content from all sorts of third-party uh, application providers. Um, so really, the trust and security boundaries are just not there. But then, as I mentioned also, there's sort of a personal or human level where there's personal boundaries, um, and people just don't seem to think through what they're exposing out there. You know, you can, uh, people have been analyzing social networks from sort of a graph theoretical perspective as well. Um, in computer science, there's some uh, you know, core algorithms and theories about how you can color a graph or uh, divide a graph or find uh, in degrees and out degrees of nodes in a graph. And really, these social networks are essentially uh, graphs in the computer science sense. And you can apply a lot of these uh, same algorithms to mapping social networks in terms of the nth degree of separation between nodes or on average how many, how many uh, friends are you away from a malicious profile that's spreading exploits, for instance. Um, so, you know, uh, a good academic kind of paper on that is uh, Christian Murthy and Wills. Um, they submitted a paper to the ACM's workshop on social networking, 2009. Um, I think if you Google for that, uh, you can probably find their paper. And they uh, did some analysis of the kind of personal information that can be found on these uh, websites, uh, ways you can mine it, and the kind of inferences that you can make um, from all this information. And, uh, you know, some folks in the, in the industry and in the community have been talking for the past couple of years about using these networks for open source information gathering, um, using it as part of the reconnaissance phase for a, a full spectrum penetration test. Um, uh, There's a gentleman by the name of Chris Gates, uh, formerly of Northrop Grumman, who's um, done a lot of talks on how do you, how do you can utilize uh, open source intelligence gathering uh, to make a more successful pen test. And of course, the same techniques are going to be used and are being used by the bad guys. Um, we'll get on to that topic a little bit later, uh, but also these social networks are now being used uh, for political repression in that um, 
uh, for instance, the authorities can map people's social networks. When they identify an individual of interest, they can then uh, infer their social connections and social networks and, uh, and then put those uh, individuals under further scrutiny, for instance. Um, I mentioned before it's a rich web environment in a lot of these applications. So it's all the classic OWASP kind of top ten vulnerabilities that you're going to be exposed to. Cross-site scripting, um, particularly because uh, of dynamic content being sourced from multiple sites, uh, you have a more exposure to cross-site request forgery sort of post interactions there. Um, all the rich content, browser plugins, multimedia players, uh, flash players, shockwave, <clears throat> it's all going to be exposed in these kind of social networking applications. So it's a great environment if you're looking to perform wholesale exploitation of particular client-side vulnerabilities or wholesale um, exploitation of just social weakness, social engineering essentially. Um, as social engineering, right? These are great uh, target-rich environments for both penetration testers but also uh, black hats in terms of uh, phishing, spear phishing, uh, and social engineering attacks through these networks. Um, these are not, you, they, these don't even have to be sophisticated or targeted at all. Um, I'm talking about, uh, we'll, later we'll talk about the cube face worm, which saw a lot of success in 2009 spreading via particularly Facebook messages um, and the propagation mechanisms of some Trojan horses, such as Kubeface, um, utilize Twitter, Facebook, and these other systems to propagate direct messages, instant messages, containing links to exploits and social engineering attacks. And so that's been a very, very successful way that black hats have used uh, these systems to propagate uh, malware, Trojan horses, and, and that kind of thing. Our all favorite uh, you know, URL shorteners. And there's, a, there's some security implications here to URL shorteners. Um, it's kind of hard to assume that the average user inspects the URL before they click it or even inspects the URL that the hyperlink is to in their status bar in their browser. However, this is you know, definitely introducing one complete layer of obfuscation in terms of a URL. Um, and it's kind of uh, uh, training people in some really bad habits. You uh, receive this little opaque URL from your buddy in an instant message, direct message, whatever, and you click on it. Um, that can be a risky step to take. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit later about the month of Twitter bugs from Avi Raf. Um, and he uncovered a lot of XSS and a lot of other vulnerabilities in third-party websites that integrate with Twitter, um, including some of the URL shorteners. Um, so I don't know if you, in September of last year, you followed this at all, but there was the month of Facebook bugs. This is uh, one in many of a series of month of bugs, kind of, or month of vulnerabilities exercises. So an uh, anonymous security researcher by the uh, name of the Harmony Guy um, identified 9,700 vulnerable Facebook apps in the month of September. Um, it turns out, uh, it, it was, I don't know how he managed the responsible disclosure process, but as far as I can tell, he performed responsible disclosure of the 9,700 vulnerable Facebook applications as well. And by the time he went public with this, uh, they had all been patched, essentially. So six of the ten most popular applications in use were found to contain uh, this nasty combination of XSS and or cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. Now, when you have when you combine those two, you can do a lot of really fun and interesting things with the Facebook APIs and the Facebook application. Um, so the Harmony guy kind of dubbed this combination of two vulnerability classes to be FAX, F-A-X-X, -X, Facebook application XSS plus XSRF for cross-site request forgery. Um, so those those popular applications that he found that had this flaw had 218 million active users per month that had these widgets running in their Facebook profiles. It's a huge user base. And people don't really consider a vulnerability in some little crappy Facebook plugin is going to expose hundreds of millions of users um, to this kind of vulnerability. Also, seven of the top ten developers had these issues. Um, so that is a registered uh, Facebook developer. You have to register with Facebook as a developer, and half of these applications were Facebook verified applications. They had been through Facebook's review process. Here's a Facebook fail, right? July 5th, 2009. Um, MI6 is the UK's uh, domestic 
intelligence agency, I believe. And the head of MI6 uh, is his identity is always kept secret. He goes by a code name. Um, so uh, this gentleman, um, I don't have his, I can't read his name right here, but if you Google for it, you'll find it. He was promoted, and he was pr promoted to run MI6, um, the British Intelligence Service. Well, his wife was very proud of this and went onto her Facebook and shared this information that I'm so proud of my husband. He's now the, in charge of MI6. Um, she, she believed that this was restricted to her group of friends. However, she had joined the London Metropolitan Facebook group, which overrode some privacy settings. So there's this kind of complex interaction between privacy settings for geographical groups versus the privacy settings for different groups of friends that you've defined. So she inadvertently shared that information with the greater London area, and uh, her husband's identity was revealed. How soon was he replaced? Uh, I'm not certain. I'm not certain. He may have assumed the title and the role, but he, you know, it's, I think it's a rotating position. He won't be there forever. LinkedIn fail. This one's not that cool, but October 9th, 2009, Robert Morgan, a Microsoft researcher, um, posted something about he's working on the next generation 128-bit Windows kernel on his Facebook. And the, and, and the press kind of grabbed onto this. It was like, ooh, Microsoft revealed a secret. They're working on 128-bit kernels. You know, a, a realistic person might think like, well, yeah, they, they better be because 64-bit is consumer grade now. Um, so to jump, kind of jump topics here, Facebook privacy settings. This stuff is complicated. You almost got to be like a CCIE to like figure out like how the interactions between the various granular policy settings all fit together when you're using them to their fullest in terms of defining different groups of friends. You could have work friends, social friends, friends and family, parents, and how do you apply policy essentially across all these different groups and keep your information compartmentalized how you want it. Not an easy task. So um, on December 10th, 2009, every, everyone logged into Facebook in the morning when they got into work and uh, they, they were greeted with a request to update their privacy settings for the new quote simplified privacy system of Facebook. In reality, the privacy settings were being made more numerous and more granular. However, they sort of introduced like this wizard to set the recommended privacy settings as recommended by Facebook. Um, so you were presented with, hey, we've introduced a new simplified system. Uh, do you want to accept the defaults? Uh, or do you want to do a whole bunch of other work and try to define your policy while you're just trying to get to Facebook? So what was the default simplified privacy policy? It was to make all your posts and all your pics public to the web for indexing as well. Um, it was to make uh, more data available, uh, or to make more data available than a lot of people's profiles were already configured for. <coughs> so um, it's, this is a, a, a smart business decision, I think, on Facebook's part, right? The, the value of their company or the value of their service is really based on the amount of information they have, how well they can index it, how well they can target advertisements, and, and things of that nature to their, their user base. So the more data is available, the more the value of Facebook service increases. Um, so the alignment, uh, the interest of Facebook and the interest of their users' privacy weren't quite aligned there. And uh, as you can see, uh, Mark Zuckerberg um, misunderstood his new privacy settings. Now he claims that this was intentional, that, that he exposed his photos for a day or two. Um, but these were private photos. The new Facebook privacy policy rolled out. And for like a day there, the founder of Facebook's embarrassing college pictures were exposed on the web and indexed, and here they are, right? A couple of them. I'm not sure what that is, but some sort of glassware. I don't know. Um, so uh, this is this is the founder of Facebook here. If you research him more, like th there's some stories coming out about um, he's kind of like the sort of robber baron, but I'm not sure. It could be sour grapes. Google Buzz. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's beta. Um, so Google Buzz. Um, could someone get me a water or something? Would you mind, anybody? Uh, so February 9th, 2010, Google rolled out their Buzz service to a, you know, it essentially was a ready-made 150 million user social network that wrote on top of Gmail. And so here's a quote from the official Gmail blog from Google that announced the introduction. 
<clears throat> it's built right into Gmail, so you don't have to peck out an entirely new set of friends from scratch. It just works. If you think about it, there's always been a big social network underlying Gmail. Buzz brings this network to the surface by automatically setting you up to follow the people you email and chat with the most. So um, previous, Google's very interested in getting in this space. They've, they acquire uh, previous efforts in this area. Um, they launched the Orkut social networking service in January 04. Um, they released this open social set of APIs in November 07. Um, that are being used by MySpace, LinkedIn, Orkut, Plaxo, Salesforce.com, and others. So Google is, is pretty active in this space, and I think they see social networking as very strategic to their success. And they just couldn't resist this opportunity to create a 150 million social net user social network from scratch. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's unusual to, that's probably not an unusual clause in terms of service, however. If you are a Comcast or a broadband residential subscriber, read the terms of service of your uh, subscription to, for broadband internet. And as I read it, essentially you grant them a global, non-exclusive right to redistribute any content you put over that pipe, right? So if you're a, imagine you're an author and you're sending your manuscript to your editor or publisher, right? Well, based on a not, not a lawyer's reading of this contract, well, Comcast now has a global non-exclusive right to redistribute your manuscript. I don't know. Thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, <coughs> Google uh, Buzz was used to share posts and notes with people that you follow. It was kind of a confusing system um, because you automatically were following the people that you emailed and chatted with the most. And by default, um, this list of first followers, as in first degree of separation, was made public as, as a public profile item. So essentially, it exposed the network of email and chat contacts for individuals using Gmail. So not only was it pretty disastrous to some people's uh, privacy and, and security, uh, it, was, it was viewed as a large PR blunder by the media and by Google. Um, they kind of miscalculated that people didn't really want to turn their email contacts into a social network. Um, so two days after the rollout, Google deployed, Google rolled out some fixes in about two days after this. Um, so here's some press clippings showing the kind of reaction the media was having to Google Buzz, right? Right, so the point being made is it, I probably was a little bit kind to Google in using the word default. In reality, this was kind of turned on. There was no, there was actually no effective way, as far as I can tell, in the first two days to disable it. So, uh, yeah, it, it was foisted upon a lot of Gmail users. I've, but, okay, so the detail, as I understand it, is whether you accepted it or not, your followers were exposed. Um, but since I don't use Gmail, I don't know. Um, so here's the, they rushed out the privacy related fixes in like two days flat. Um, pretty, pretty impressive reaction, but not so impressive debut, right? Um, so here's one change. It made the uh, people that you follow, oh, excuse me, it made the option to hide the people you follow much more prominent. Uh, they claim that option existed I'm not sure, but here, you know, it's like in bold but text. You still had to go turn it off. Right. So now it's more visible. So okay. Oh, certainly. Yeah, you turn something on for 150 million users, many of them won't notice what just, you know, I'm sure that there's plenty of users that have it wide open as it was on day one. Um, it, they added links so that you could block, uh, block users in more places. So before. Um, you couldn't, previously you could only block users that had a public Google profile. Um, so if someone had never created a Google profile, but was a Gmail user, which is very common, Buzz turned on, you guys had communicated, you're, they're following you automatically now, you couldn't block them, you could not remove them from your list of followers because they didn't have a Google public profile. Now, so they introduced the ability to do that. Um, and here, um, 
Well, like I mentioned before, right, so there's a lot of inferences, uh, and this information is, is valuable to, for lots of different purposes. Um, you know, I have firsthand incident responder kind of knowledge of incidents where attackers, all they were after was your PGP web of trust. They didn't even take the secret keys. All they wanted to know is, who does this individual communicate securely with, all right? So if people are willing to go do a targeted attack just to snatch your PGP web of trust, um, this is like, this is pretty useful too. And uh, you wouldn't even have to export anything. You just like harvest the profiles on the web. Yeah. <laughs> So here and here, the other change they made was it now breaks out and makes clear like who has a public profile and who doesn't um, of the people that are following you. So like the day it came out, no February sixteenth, like uh, our snake on hackers dot org, someone, um, a guy going by the handle of Trainwreck, who is supposedly the guy that like exposed all of Miley, Miley Cyrus's photos or something, uh, didn't, didn't follow that one, but uh, he emailed our snake like, hey, check out this XSS. And yeah, sure enough, there was an XSS in the location services of, Go of Buzz, so you could uh, you could do some interesting things there. Though the cool thing, the, what makes this a little bit worse than the average XSS is that this was in the core Google.com domain. It wasn't in Google Groups.com. It wasn't in um, wasn't in the other Google brand domain. So if you can get an XSS on .google.com, it's more valuable. And also the XSS. And the XSS worked over HTTPS. So really sweet. A nice Google XSS there. Um, pol right, political repression. You know, we talked a little bit about, you know, what's the value of this information or, or what kind of risks do people, uh, are people exposed to when this information is exposed? Um, so during the, uh, back in June of, of last summer, um, the Iranian elections happened. Uh, there was controversy over the contested presidential election. Some widespread protests took place in uh, Iran. So a lot of this was, uh, or some of this was being played out on Twitter and some of the other facial, uh, uh, some of the other social networks. So um, there was a kind of a battle going on between the, the opposition or the protesters and uh, forces loyal to the government. Um, Iranian revolutionary forces, uh, and so there was stock puppet profiles being created. Uh, there was entrapment going on, you know, uh, of uh, false profiles being used to try to lure in uh, folks sympathetic to the opposition. Uh, disinformation being spread, and, and of course, mapping of social networks and mapping of contents and associations. So here's. Um, uh, I think this was generated with Maltigo, I'm not sure. Uh, this is from a blog, Patronus Analytical. Um, and this is, the, this is a node, this is a, a graph of Twitter communications uh, during the Iranian election protests. And in the middle, that, that central node is AJE underscore producer. Um, and uh, it was an individual or, or someone that was um, claiming to be a producer for Al Jazeera's English language television network. Um, and the st as the story goes, this individual was impersonating a producer for Al Jazeera's uh, television network um, and was requesting and reaching out to all the people they could find that were expressing uh, opposition sentiments and requesting that they reach out and contact them via cell phone uh, or email uh, so that they could get their message out through Al Jazeera. Uh, we don't believe that that was a real Al Jazeera producer. So that diagram shows a recent recent direct communications with about 20 other Twitter users, and then uh, their communications out to the next node. So here's another um, graph of Twitter traffic during the protests. Um, you've got two uh, sock puppets, uh, Iran Source 45 and Iran Source, uh, that were allegedly um, disseminating disinformation uh, in relation to the opposition protests. Um, and they're the dominant nodes. You can barely make it out. You can barely make it out, but there's little teeny nodes surrounding that all over, like spokes. And similar to this one. And you see that pattern when you graph it because um, these individuals were sending tweets directly to other users 
and were replying directly to questions, but weren't like publishing stuff on a public timeline kind of thing. And then in the middle there, there's five users that were like sort of anti-spammers on Twitter trying to counter the information that these two nodes were pushing out. I think this is these these individuals contacting the people that this person contacted to say, "Hey, they're fake." Yeah. Like automated I, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, bots finding bots could be, could be. Um, the uh, historical attacks on social networking, right? So the big three: Facebook, MySpace, Twitter. Um, anybody familiar with the Sammy MySpace worm? I think I gave a talk about it like Outer Zone two years ago, so I'm probably gonna like blast through it. This is like, as far as I can tell, it was the first real in the wild XSS worm to spread through a web application. Um, so Sammy Kemkar uh, uh, was behind this, and it was kind of, you know, I don't think he intended to. Obviously, he didn't intend to get in trouble, but um, there may have been some innocent, you know, kind of uh, hacker mentality oh my gosh, look what I can do. I want a million friends, and I think I can create a million friends over one evening. Um, so the author created this XSS script. He updated his profile with it. When you viewed his profile, it would uh, exploit your profile, make you his friend. You'd post a message saying, like, he's your hero, and uh, then, you'd, then you'd send messages to all your contacts. 20 hours, more than a million users. Fastest spreading computer virus in history um, at the time. And then uh, MySpace sued him in civil court, I believe. Um, you know, he got in some trouble, but as far as I can tell, he's sort of like a legit security researcher these days. He goes to conferences. He's doing some interesting work. Good for you, Sammy. You're my hero. Um, MySpace worm propagation. This is uh, it's not a very good graph, but you know, you can see the hockey puck or the uh, hockey stick kind of thing. Um, this is from his own blog. He was like live blogging his exploit. Um, and he posted this picture, his screenshot from his profile, and he's like, look, kick ass. I rule. I got a million friends. Uh, she wants me. That says there. Mad Photoshop skills. Yep. Um, well, it was pretty clear, like, post-incident forensics would have shown, like, his was the first profile. He posted this payload, and then it took off from there. So I don't think, even if he was, like, silent, like, they could have traced it to patient zero, I believe. I mean, even if he doesn't, yeah, I mean, if he didn't do the friend payload, if he just trashed people's profiles or something. So Twitter, Twitter is a big... Uh, fun sort of research project for security. Um, cool, I'm doing pretty good on time. Uh, how are they growing? Like Twitter is now, like their primary strategic growth is all SMS based. Like forget the web apps, uh, forget the fat client applications, like they're expanding globally via SMS. So they signed an agreement, um, I don't have the date, you know, the past six, 12 months with Bharti Airtel, it's the largest uh, wireless sub provider in India. Um, has about 110 million subscribers like a year ago um, to allow full SMS Twitter interfacing with all their user base. Uh, Access Indonesia, which is the largest uh, GSM provider in Indonesia, which is you know rapidly growing, has signed a similar deal. Um, you know, Twitter has worked with partnerships with MySpace and AOL, um, so you know that's kind of their growth there. So this here, I don't know any people don't. This is the fail whale. So when Twitter like is down or it's over capacity or whatever, you can't get to it. They like throw up this GIF and they're like, "Oh, you know, we're down, but it's cool because we have like good graphic designers." Um, so April 2008, you know, this is kind of a history of some of the vulnerabilities there. McGrew Security um, founded like a super super simple CSRF vulnerability, and it, you could just um, when you visited their page, it would just post a message to your public timeline, like you know, "Thanks for visiting McGrew Security. You got pwned." Um, Twitter staging server, so Damon uh, P. Cortesi, uh, who's at DA Court, um, you'll see like some screenshots and some sources that I credit to him. He's done a lot of work on Twitter security. Um, check him out. So July 2008, he found like Twitter had their internal staging servers like sitting on the internet um, without any authentication. 
you know, and you could like look at like it was like MySQL monitor, the status of all their MySQL databases. Like it was essentially the control center for Twitter, and it was sitting on the web. Um, so he responsibly contacted him and said, "Hey, um, you guys might want to like put this behind a firewall." And um, they fixed it, except they forgot to like add authentication um, to the HTTPS virtual host. So he said, "Oh, but whoops, try again." And they they fix it. Of course, they implemented the fix with HTTP basic authentication. Um, Twitter rank. Uh, this was like a little social engineering experiment he did, uh, where uh, you just like create some just totally bogus story. Like, um, you know, if you give me your username and password to Twitter, you'll, you know, I'll increase. I'll give you your your Twitter rank, just some score. Like, see how cool you are. So he, like Damon, Twitter rank was done by somebody else. Damon's like, can I crank it up a notch? Can I turn it to 11? Twitter awesomeness. All right, look how just ghetto this website looks. Um, as the name implies, Twitter awesomeness is to see how awesome you are on Twitter. Tell me how awesome I am. Twitter user ID, Twitter password. Check the box. Tell everyone on Twitter how awesome I am. Disclaimer. Right there, red. I'm in your Twitters, stealing your creds. It's okay, 259 other people gave their passwords too. Please note, if you haven't noticed, this doesn't really calculate your awesomeness. So he got like hundreds of users, like he didn't even advertise this crap. Like he got hundreds of users in there like giving them his passwords, giving them their passwords. Not really a Twitter fail, it's a human fail. What, I mean, what percentage of those hundreds are bots? Um, he, well, I don't think he's... Well, the question, instead of saying are they automated, I just asked, like, are, are people giving me their real passwords? I don't think he verified them because that might be unauthorized access. But, um, so, yeah, you can type anything you want and get your awesomeness score for free. Um, <laughs> so the user search feature, um, they, like, for a long time, their search functions kind of sucked. So uh, they debuted in December 08, like, the ability to search users. Whoa. Uh, XSS, fail, right? Oh, no's. That's the alert right there. Um, information disclosures, right? December 08, like, uh, until December 08, any third-party site could just use the Twitter API to determine when you visit their website what your Twitter, if you use Twitter and what your username was. And, like, there's the JSON callback right there. It's super simple. You just, like, call Twitter. Um, it, it basically utilizes, like, the credentials that are cached in your browser. And... Uh, and it just said, prints the username in an alert box. That's the proof of concept there. So any website you visited, if you use that same browser and you didn't use private browsing mode or whatever as mitigations, they could as soon as you visit, they'd be like, oh, you know, he's PBR ninety X on Twitter. Um, their administration interface got pwned in May. Um, you probably shouldn't use the word happiness for a password. Um, and the the way it got pwned, I think, is that uh, one of the founders, or or, or J Jason Go allegedly Jason Goldman, director of product management with Twitter, um, was using like Yahoo Mail um, with the same password and got fished. Um, maybe it was spear phishing. I don't know. Uh, they tried. They're like maybe his Yahoo Mail password is the one to the whole Twitter, you know, brain in the sky, and it was. So um, th so this guy. Uh, I can't. I, I don't know if I have his handle in the notes on one of these. I think he was posting these to French language underground boards. But like, so he went into their internal administrative interface and started taking screenshots of like everybody's like internal Twitter profile. So like, in the administration interface, you can go to a profile and it gives you a lot of information like what IP addresses are they authenticating from, um, what users have they banned, how many how many follow attempts are they doing per day. Um, the use of the API rates, like how much are they using the API? Are they a bot? Um, was there a bunch of people that had admin like this? It's, we don't really know. I mean, the director of product management had it. Um, I'm not sure. But I think their internal support staff, this is the application they used. So you can look at the notes. There's like tickets, tickets and alerts. And uh, this is the handle. Oh, the other like big fail is that the account name, the accounts on the internal administrative system are, are the same accounts that the Twitter employees used on Twitter. So like at, at Cool Jill is also like the way Cool Jill who works for Twitter administers the whole system. 
So you've got like Twitter at men's with usernames like Crystal, Kami Cat, you know. So, and here you can see um, whose whose site is this? Oh, this is Britney Spears' profile, right? Her Gmail address, IP address she logs in from, or her uh, PR team. She has a real problem with like passwords getting reset by another user, like three times on the fifth of. January and, and once the prior day and you can see some support notes and what you find is that the celebrities like get um, Gold or get white glove service from Twitter. They have their own representatives like account at Zex at Twitter that their PR people work with when their account gets hijacked every day um, <laughs> So, you know, like you'll find these like support histories uh, And it'll be like, you know, their passwords like pwned. It doesn't say how they don't do any incident response like you're, you know, again and again and again. Yeah, and they have a phone number. She's like, "Oh, you can call me. Hi, it's Crystal. You can call me on my cell phone if your password gets pwned again tonight." Um, who, who's whose profile is this? Ashton Kutcher's profile. Um, so he, you can see he uses a AOL.com email address, and he likes the TweetDeck application. And he has blocked Perez Hilton. Drunken stepfather, Ashton's father, Ashton's daddy, and other variations. Of, these are the users he's blocked. I don't, I haven't like done a real investigation of Ashton, but I think he might have some stuff with his dad in his background. <laughs> oh, I've obscured it. No, actually, the the screenshot I received off of one of these outlets was already obscured. Here's here's um, President Barack Obama's um, Twitter account. Um, you can see like there's tons of password resets in early January 2009. Like here's the seventh January seventh eighth 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 ninth. These are all password reset by another user, where like they've lost control of the account or something. Um, either that or there's like a war going on inside Obama's PR. Um, you know, department of who has control of the Twitter profile. Um, <laughs> and so here on the 5th, um, Crystal in, in service, you know, Crystal seems to handle a lot of the celebs and politicians. Uh, user account hacked. Someone, not me, probably biz, restored account to normalcy. And as soon as I don't... Um, so you can see Barack, um, he joined Twitter on May 5th, 2007. He's thinking ahead. And, uh, and the first user he banned, or at least the first user listed in the ban list is kkk for life <laughs> um, Here's Mikey Twitter worm. Uh, so we talked about the Sammy, tw Sammy MySpace worm. Uh, April 09, like a little less than a year ago, um, Stalk Daily, which was a uh, competitor to Twitter, uh, a, a worm hit Twitter, spreading a message about joining Stalk Daily, um, and the link would take you to a cross-site scripting attack payload uh, that was um, exploiting an XSS in the Twitter uh, website. It's, it caused the profiles to send the, the similar message out to their contacts, um, and uh, here's like a screenshot of. A bunch of people's uh, tweets uh, that their profile had been pwned by this worm and that they were propagating the payload to others and here's the actual attack payload like it went through many variations so like every time Twitter would fix the XSS he was using he'd like evade their filter like five minutes later and then they'd go fix something else and then he'd say screw it I'm gonna use another parameter ha and then they'd fix oh they oh shit we got XSS on this other parameter they'd add a filter he'd evade that filter so it was cat and mouse for like a day there um, so he's basically just doing little Ajax payload with a cross-site scripting um, here's he 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 confessed to what he was up to Mikey and so he put a message on the stock daily website that he had, he, I have came clean and have accepted the responsibility for the worm. Read the interview here. And he was interviewed with uh, some news website. Oh, you might not want to click, you might have learned by now, don't click links from Mikey. And here's the post on um, Twitter's website about what was going on. 
they called it the stalkdaily.com worm. Um, they said, reassured, no passwords, phone numbers, or other sensitive information were compromised as part of this attack. We only share that with our business partners. Um, cleaning up Mikey, so someone launched another worm that was like removing the malicious payloads and fixing the profiles. Um, and so here's the cleaning up Mikey worm that was launched. And, uh, and so what it would do, it, it also had a little messaging payload to spread itself, but it said, Twitter, hire Mikey. So someone's looking out for him, you know? He, he'd be more productive in, on staff at Twitter than in jail, probably. Um, and here's a picture of the perp, right? Sort of gothy looking kid, maybe adolescent, I'm not sure. He's working the angles, you know, for that pit. So I mentioned cube face before. Um, the cube face worm is a, is a really prevalent uh, piece of malware. It's been spreading for like a year or two. Um, here's just some pictures of like tweets that the worm sends out. When it when it pones you, it, it'll grab your Twitter credentials and it'll start propagating itself through your Twitter uh, followers. Have you ever seen this stuff? Have you seen like links arrive in Facebook or Twitter that's just clearly not really from your friend? Here's like a, a, a lot of it's social engineering. So it'll take you to a website that looks like uh, YouTube or Facebook and it'll say, oh, you need the new version of Flash to play the video or you need this multimedia codec. I think codecs were a couple years ago, Flash was 09. And now a lot of the, um, we're seeing more and more move to like true on web browser exploit kits to push the malware on you. And if the exploits don't work, then it'll pop up a scary message and try to social engineer you. Um, Twitter internal documents, right, uh, were exposed in July '09. This is still like just beating up on Twitter. I'm sorry, Twitter. Um, so the founder's account got uh, compromised, and they were all using like Google Docs for domains or something like that. Um, and so this guy who goes by Hacker Kroll sent like 300 docs to a bunch of media outlets, and it was some of it was just lame stuff like lunch orders and you know, like catering and like, oh my God, Twitter likes roast beef, you know, and, um, but, but some of it was interesting stuff. It was like partner agreements, right? Like who they're p putting NDAs in place with, um, phone logs of employees, calendar, uh, meeting calendars, who's meeting with who, um, uh, financial projections, right? And there was a controversy, um, one of the TechCrunch, TechCrunch actually published a batch of these documents in quasi-redacted form, and there was this whole like, is that responsible journalism debate going on or whatever? So, is that isn't that a oxymoron? A month of Twitter bugs. Avi Raf, I mentioned this earlier. Um, he so there's all sorts of, like this whole ecosystem of websites that integrate with Twitter. Like you probably a lot of people use TwitPic one of the most popular. Well, there's all sorts of like other uh, third-party apps and websites that you know you integrate with your Twitter profile and make it cooler and more awesome. Um, but they all were full of cross-site scripting and SQL injection and CSRF. Um, but the surprising thing from this whole exercise is a lot, and in fact, the majority of these third-party sites were very responsive. When Avi Roth contacted them, they were deploying fixes in like 24 hours, you know, or less on frequently. So, um, yeah, they're writing web applications. They're going to be vulnerabilities. Kudos for fixing them pretty quickly in, uh, when they were disclosed to them. I don't know if Dave uh, Dave's in here, but he runs uh, Arata Security runs his TwiGuard service, where it's kind of like monitoring Twitter for abuse and, and uh, exploits. So how to hack campaign is sort of a, a viral um, uh, campaign to spread some malware that would all link to uh, a malicious Flash Player exe with a bitly shortened link. Uh, this is a social engineering scam here called Best Followers, and it's like changed its name again and again. It was like Greatest Followers, like, I, I don't even know all the names, but it's been changing its name, but it's basically a scam to get you to like provide your Twitter credentials to them. And in return, they promise like to create tons of followers. So this is an attractive service to like someone in PR or marketing or who's trying to use viral marketing techniques to sell something or to generate leads. Um, and if you work with like PR and marketing, like they might, could, do you think they could fall for it? No comment. 
So it, they have a disclaimer. It says, our site does not fish accounts. Any content on this site may not be 100% accurate. <laughs> By using the site you agree, needfollowers.com, the one point is needfollowers.com, is not to be monitored or involved with any legal matters. That's a reasonable, reasonable uh, terms of service, right? Um, so here's like, and, and the website looks pretty ghetto. Um, and to, to like opt out or to close the account, you have to provide them your password again. <laughs> so it's like if you would like to close or opt out, please enter your username and password that you signed up with. If you don't remember your information, it's the same as your Twitter information. Um, and then they have, uh, so it, total scam, right? And what happens, like you don't really get lots of followers, but you send out lots of messages when you join. And all the messages are saying, like, I finally found the best way to get tons of followers for free. Okay. Didn't quite work out. Twitter porn name. This was another social engineering scam. Um, and it, it was, I don't, I'm not sure, like, who started it. Uh, but it was a great way to get people to reveal, like, sort of, like, security questions and stuff. Uh, so they were like, hey, everybody, uh, tweet your Twitter porn name. It's the name of your first pet and the name of the street you grew up on, or perhaps the name of the head teacher in your school. So there's definitely a union there between like, you know, the authentication questions that you use uh, with financial institutions and things of that nature, or to reset passwords. I'm not sure if this was actually just malicious or just plain stupid. Um, so here's like the tweet, you know, the Twitter porn name, right? You can see Dave Lamb, his porn name is Pims Dave. And it's, it's okay, though, because why? It saves any personal info being given away. I don't know what that means. Um, cool, the, the Russia-Georgia uh, war, I guess, uh, was it August last summer? It's been, yeah, I guess that's when it was. Um, so there's a denial of service attack. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. The, the war was not August last year. I don't recall the date of the war. But uh, there was a DOS attack that took Twitter offline on August 6, 2009. Um, and it was related to the conflict of uh, the Russian Federation and the Republic of Georgia. Um, so there was a profile on Twitter called CYXYMU that was sending out um, pro-Georgian, sort of Georgian nationalist tweets. And uh, some hacktivists sympathetic to the Russian Federation and their cause um, didn't like that and decided to to silence this one Twitter profile, they're going to just DOS Twitter. And they took Twitter down for part of the day. Um, and I, I was never able to get details of how the DOS worked, whether it just like a brute force like bandwidth DOS, or did they find something uh, interesting to do to Twitter's infrastructure to cause it to happen. And, and of course, this was written up by Brian Krebs, um, formerly of the Washington Post. Uh, we're going to, i got about 15 minutes left. Um, We'll get into like how you can actually, you know, like subvert some Twitter authentication stuff here. So Twitter, um, the legacy authentication mechanism is HTTP basic auth, which is essentially just a base 64 of the credential username colon password that's sent as HTTP header. It's essentially the simplest way to authenticate using the HTTP protocol. And it completely relies upon something at a lower level in the protocol stack provide for confidentiality and integrity, like SSL TLS typically. Um, and so the, the, the way they promote authenticating is OAuth, which is sort of a, uh, it's not really like Kerberos, but it's sort of a uh, ticket-based uh, authentication mechanism where you do not have to provide your Twitter username and password to the third-party uh, site. Instead, they request a ticket on your behalf from Twitter, so, like, sort of like if you're familiar with how Kerberos works. Um, so, and then third-party client apps or sites that want to use OAuth have to register with Twitter, which is a step that you don't need. If you want to write a, a client app just using basic auth, we'll write one in 10 lines of Python, right? Um, but to use OAuth, you need like an OAuth authentication account that's been reviewed by Twitter. Um, but it's a huge challenge for them to disable basic auth. There's, um, there's like 10,000 client apps uh, or excuse me, there's tens, of, there's thousands of client apps out there. So it's it's the user base problem, right? Um, so you, uh, one thing that needs to happen is more more pressure needs to be put on these sites, I guess, and app developers to fix this and move to OAuth. Because you can see how this fails. Um, 
So the coolest fail of the basic off stuff was, I don't know if you followed uh, November, the disclosure of the SSL renegotiation gap. This is a vulnerability from uh, Ray Dispensa, or Marsh Ray and Steve Dispensa of Phone Factor. Um, and they responsibly disclosed this. Um, it's a, essentially a way to do SSL renegotiation uh, to, a, to uh, be able to post a request as a man in the middle attacker through SSL. And this Turkish researcher, I'm really, I'm, I'm sad I don't have his name handy, uh, Security Goose, I think is his handle. He published this really cool proof of concept that actually used uh, it, it. Twitter's HP service supported new renegotiation. They had not turned it off yet. So he used SSL renegotiation to compromise people's Twitter credentials uh, over when they were sent over HPS. It was pretty cool. Um, but OAuth is not perfect either. Um, you know, it's it's the permissions are just read or read write. So and the, so either you grant the website, the third party website or application, the ability to read your profile, or you have to grant it full read write access. That's not very, you know, granular. And most of these services are going to require write permissions to like offer the cool value that they claim. Um, and read permissions include direct messages. So reading, they can, you know, if you, when you grant read permissions to an OAuth enabled service, they can go through all your private messages, everything you've ever sent through direct messages and pull that out, right? So you really have to trust these things. Um, it, it includes like who you're following that's protected. So people that you've, the following relationships you have that you wanted to keep private, well that's included in read permissions. Um, and the third-party client apps, instead of storing the username and password, they just store an OAuth token. But it's not, it's not clear at all like, that you can't just like, kidnap that token and use that somehow. Uh, Twitter botnet command and control. Like there's an open source project out there and you can like, control botnets via Twitter tweets um, or also JPEGs with commands in them or tiny URLs. Kind of cool. Uh, Tom Easton and Robin Wood have worked on this. They've presented at it last summer at DEF CON 17. They also uh, gave some additional information on it at ShmooCon 2010 when they released version 3 and added LinkedIn support. So back to this basic auth, like as of, as of a few months ago, Twitter would always expose the session cookies, okay? Um, like even, so like when you go to the Twitter website, even, even if you type in HTTPS, Twitter.com, boom, it loads up securely. You log in, it posts it via HPS, and it falls back to, S to clear text. Now, I've been able to use um, uh, NoScript, which has an option to force SSL on certain wildcard domains and such. So I've been able to use NoScript to force it into SSL, but unless you use NoScript, uh, you can authenticate with your username and password to their website SSL, but then your session credentials, the session cookies are just getting passed back and forth, which, you know, there's all sorts of tools out there, ferret, hamster, whatever, that can do session sidejacking, session hijacking, cookie hijacking, all this. They do have an authentication token, a nonce built in to prevent CSRF or an attempt to prevent CSRF. Um, but if you have, if you've observed the whole session, you know what that is because that was sent down as part of the JavaScript that loaded the form. Uh, so this Twitter CNC stuff, like this open source project is cool, but like in August '09, it was there was real Twitter CNC being used by a Brazilian-based botnet. You know, it, it was a bot controller was like posting tweets that uh, were Base64 encoded URLs, and uh, the URLs led to a blob of text, which was a PK zip archive, and then the PK zip archive had a UPX packed info stealer Trojan inside of it that was uh, a Boozus Boozus Trojan. So someone briefly was using Twitter to control a botnet and distribute stuff. There's a screenshot of it. The name of the Twitter profile was Update and Hacksaw. Oh yeah, so I was talking about Twitter website auth. I've got like eight, nine minutes. Um, so it's loaded via HTTP by default. If you use HTTPS explicitly, it will load it. But there is no HTTP redirect and HTTPS redirect in place. Um, so here is the form, right? Uh, it uses the HPS URL to form submit. Um, it does include 
this authenticity token, which is a randomly generated nonce uh, as in a mitigation against CSRF. And that comes down as part of the form when it loads the, the login page. But um, if you understand like CSRFs and XSSs, you know, if you can find an XSS, a, a good XSS in the application, then this nonce and this token isn't really, it, it doesn't prevent you from like doing anything because you already, you can access it um, via the DOM, I think. It's not going to, I mean, you can code around this, right? I don't think it's, uh, maybe there's two reasons they do it. The, the obvious reason is this is the way you're supposed to mitigate against CSRF. The not so obvious reason is, hey, we want a walled garden, right? And we don't want bots running amok on our service and harvesting information. But that's not really true because they offer all these APIs and they make deals with Google and Bing to index everything and make it available as real-time indexes. So, I mean... I'll just use the API, right? But this is, I think this is there to protect against the CSRF. And they have some hidden form fields that I'm not sure how they're really used yet. Um, whether it's like, oh, you have, like it sends a random form field called Q, for instance, when I tested it, or sign in underscore Q. And maybe if you don't submit that back, it's going to say, hey, uh, he, he didn't, it's not a real browser on the other end. Um, and after login, it falls back to HTTP. So your session cookies and the, authentic, the secret authenticity token is being passed back and forth in the clear. Um, the, so the session cookie is called under Twitter underscore sesh. Um, the expire is set to zero. Okay. Um, I think Google, like years ago, when Maynard and, and Rob Graham like did the side jacking stuff, like within hours of their talk at Black Hat, Google cookies had. Uh, expiration on them. Um, but when I like looked at this, it's like expire set to zero on that cookie. It's good forever. Um, hopefully when you log out and validates the cookie somehow in the back end, but otherwise that's a perfectly valid cookie for forever. Client apps, most of them use basic auth still. They don't use OAuth, right? A lot of them don't even use SSL. You know, I'm not going to name names, but I tested one of the if you have, uh, if you just like want to use a Twitter client app and you're running Ubuntu, well, that app is going to um, fall back clear text. So all you got to do is you want to pwn somebody's basic auth. Well, put it in a firewall rule to send a reset back. The Twitter has one IP. They don't do, they don't do complicated DNS, any casting or whatever. You resolve Twitter.com, you get an IP address back. Put a firewall rule in there for a reset for 443 desk port. When someone uses that Twitter application, and a lot of Twitter apps are going to do this, it attempts SSL, it gets the reset back, and it happily just sends the credentials in clear text. There's no visible indication to the user whatsoever. Unless you're sniffing the wire, you would not know that your username and password just went out in the clear. All because someone just blocked port 443 to Twitter, and it exposed your password. Haphazard validation of SSL certificates when it does use SSL. So there's a lot of problems there. You can attack these apps like uh, you can attack these apps. They expose a big attack service. Um, I've set up uh, Peach Fuzzer as a rogue Twitter service, like a, it fuzzes the clients. Um, and so basically, like, you can fuzz JSON, RSS, Atom, XML parsers, all that stuff is exposed in these client applications. Um, so it was a pain in the ass to get Peach to actually fuzz client applications, but it can be done. Or you could do some interesting evil man in the middle attacks, like make, you know, change everybody's timelines to say I hate PBR 90x. So you know, all of a sudden you log into Twitter and there's 200 followers and their tweet is just they hate you, you, you know, <laughs> um, or they love you. Twi tweet Deck had some issues. Um, they had one call, one API call that they forgot to use SSL on. Whoops. In a tweet deck, yeah, but remember I mentioned stuff about like silently falling back to clear text and like doing haphazard certificate validation. Uh, we've tested it. It's an exercise for the viewer. <laughs> Sector conference, wall of shame, Twitter credentials all over the place from this tweet deck bug. 
that's all I got. I just wanted to uh, give greets out to the folks at DC 404. I'm not a Freeside Atlanta member, but I wanted to say thank you to all them, and it was good to see them out here and, and uh, plug in that. And uh, many thanks to Skydog, uh, Scott, Kevin, um, everybody who's, who's uh, made this possible, who's videotaping it. It's good to be back again. I skipped uh, Outer Zone last year, and uh, thanks for coming out.